Welcome to What the Paper Said, in which I, Patrick Crozier, skim through the times from 100 years ago, read some of the articles, and comment on the ones I find interesting. In this episode, we'll be catching up with all the news from the last month or so. Silly season 1923, so to speak. But first of all, the not-so-silly stories. Um, Gustav Stresemann has become Chancellor of Germany. Uh, effectively, Prime Minister. An Admiral... Yamamoto has become Prime Minister of Japan, but it's not that Admiral Yamamoto. Well, I'm assuming you've heard of an Admiral Yamamoto who bombed Pearl Harbor on one occasion. Um, but this is an entirely different Admiral Yamamoto, it turns out. Um, anyway, poor chap, because I think, spoiler alert, he may have uh, quite a lot on his hands quite soon. The dock strike, which I've mentioned before, has ended. Uh, uh, the former US president, uh, Warren Harding, has been buried. Um, talking of chancellors, uh, Neville Chamberlain has become Chancellor of the Exchequer in Britain. Uh, there's been quite a lot of uh, space given over to a uh, exchange of correspondence between the British and French governments over the occupation of the Ruhr. Well, I say that, there's, there's, this has been ongoing ever since the French occupied the Ruhr in January, um, and not a lot has uh, has changed. The French in this reply essentially saying that they have every justification for doing what they're doing. Uh, talking of France, uh, they're experiencing a record heat wave, um, but for reasons that escape me, um, Arrête Louis uh, are doing nothing. As mentioned earlier, the dock strike has ended. This has prompted some discussion as to how the dockers were able to stay out as long as they were. In those days, there were things known as poor law boards. They were locally run and funded governmental bodies that looked after the poor and destitute. In the case of London, there seems to have been a pooling arrangement in which all the London boards paid into one pot and all or any of them could withdraw money from it as the need arose. Well, Poplar Poor Law Board had been dipping into it rather a lot in order to pay the dockers strike pay, which is a, an arrangement which should actually be formalised. I, I, I kid you not, and one of the reasons why, why strikes were so bad in the 1970s was that, it was that if you went on strike, the government would pay you while you were on strike. So, well, that's quite an incentive. And it's one of the reasons the minor strike failed in 1984-85 was, was that um, the Thatcher government had ended strike pay. There was a case of train vandalism south of Newcastle uh, in which someone seems to have placed um, some piece of metal on the track in such a way that it was likely to derail a train. I have long tended to the belief that uh, vandalism is a uh, more modern phenomenon, uh, but um, apparently not. There was a case in which uh, two men were arrested for uh, possession of large quantities of drugs, but when it was investigated, it turned out what the police thought was opium was in fact hashish, which is a form of cannabis. And at this time, cannabis is not illegal. There has been a walking contest between two MPs. One challenged, or sent out a challenge that uh, for other MPs to uh, walk from Banbury to Oxford. And uh, another MP uh, took him up on the challenge. Anyway, they set off from Banbury and um, neither of them made it. Uh, it's 23 miles, by the way. Someone who did make it was a Sebastian Tiraboski, uh, an Argentine who has managed to swim the channel, or at least he says he has, but uh, the time he did it in is a third less than the existing record, which is, let's face it, suspicious. Uh, there was a story, a really rather ridiculous story, um, from this is actually from the 10th of August, which claimed that uh, the former Prime Minister um, Andrew Bonalaw Law was in much improved health. No, he isn't, he is terminally ill. So, uh, your occasional reminder never believe everything you read in the newspapers. 
Eamon de Valera has been arrested in Ireland. He was the leader of the uh, rebels in the recent civil war. The British ambassador to America has visited Ellis Island, in case you don't know about Ellis Island. Ellis Island was where all immigrants to America uh, were processed um, before entering the country. And uh, the ambassador said, well, this is really a disgrace because it's, it's it's, the conditions are very dirty. He also says something along the lines of it's also a disgrace that the washed are kept in the same conditions as the unwashed. And I have to say, I'm utterly puzzled by this this statement. I mean, it's it's one of these phrases that get used, the great unwashed, uh, which I... Uh, I take to mean the poor, or, or in, in more modern parlance, to mean, to mean the poor. But it, it seems to mean something much more specific in those days, but surely it doesn't mean they haven't washed. I mean, that means, does that mean they have never been washed, or washed occasionally, or just smell a bit, or or what? It, anyway, anyway. The American government, of course, absolutely denied that anything that there's anything to worry about at the Ellis Island facilities. And anyway, uh, the ambassador's visit was some time ago when things have changed. Given recent events, my interest was piqued by the annual general meeting of the Niger Company. Unfortunately, despite the fact that the, that the report took up two whole columns in the Times, I was unable to find out what this company actually did. Mining, I would guess, but it doesn't say so. However, it was stated that West Africa, as in the West African government, as in the, the, the part of the British Empire, was losing money. I think I've mentioned that before in uh, relation to India. Could this be the real reason that the British Empire came to an end? In Signs of the Times, I came across an advert for an Austin 7. Now, if you don't know what an Austin 7 was, it was a small mass-produced car, which sold in the millions. The advertised price was £165, which, if you convert to and from gold and then apply the Crozier fudge factor, gives you something about £27,000. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, but you have to take into account that it was small and, like all the cars of the time, incredibly unreliable. I also came across a complaint from a socialist who was lamenting the fact that universities are naturally conservative institutions. On Saturday the 11th of August, the Times published a letter from a W.D. Gainsford. I am amused at the confusion of mind which results in the use of such words as honesty, fraud and the like in regard to tax paying, especially that of income tax. Public ethic seems to float in a very cloudy atmosphere. A tax is not a debt. It is a payment necessarily demanded from those who may or may not approve of its purpose, but which payment is justified on the mere ground that society cannot get on without it. The tax collector's excuse for what would otherwise be robbery with violence is that it is a necessity of modern civilization, And so it is. Slightly undermining his argument there, I think. He goes on. But that the taxpayer is under any moral obligation to pay is ridiculous. The Countess of Salisbury did not deny the executioner's legal right to her head. But he must get it as he could. She was not going to help him. The said Countess was executed in the reign of Henry VIII. He goes on. The evil is inherent in the stupidity of taxing what cannot be seen. So long as we have income tax and death duties, and such like, we must continue to have perfectly honest and justifiable attempts to evade extortion. Heh. At present, tax collector and taxpayer are in the relative position of Punch's giant chartist and a little special constable. Remember that if I kill you, it is nothing, but if you kill me, by Jove, it is murder. Explain that one. The Chartist movement was a mid-19th century movement aimed at widening the uh, franchise or the number of people who could vote. And the cartoon in question has the uh, small, badly dressed special constable 
uh, saying those words to a giant chartist. I must confess, my, uh, my sympathies are with the constable. But that's by the by. Anyway, he goes on. The tax collector declares habitually a mere formal lie that he believes your income to be 50% more than he thinks possible. And his surmise actually stands as fact until you prove its falsity. Oh boy. If you do so prove, he shrugs his shoulders and goes on to the next case. If you are unable to produce evidence enough to prove him a liar, you go to prison. I think it's worth pointing out that at this time, income tax and death duties are relatively new. He goes on. All this injustice results originally from the ethical blunder of supposing a tax to be a debt, and immediately from this practical blunder of taxing what cannot be seen, I think that's a rather important point, formerly we raised our revenue upon expenditure, i.e. on things visible, customs excise, and personal luxuries. Now our principal revenue is raised by penalties upon industry and thrift, this month there's been uh, an ongoing correspondence uh, over the question of road safety. There seems to be a, a, quite a consensus out there that the main problems are drunkenness and um, people not obeying the rules of the road. And then as now there's a, quite a lot of controversy over the question of speed. Some people are proposing uh, driving tests. Uh, others are pointing out that if people are going to be tested, how are, they, how are they going to learn? Others are pointing out that, well, maybe they could be issued with a temporary license, and uh, which entitles them to drive as long as a, a proper driver, someone with a full license, has a, uh, is with them. Anyway, that's all for this week. I aim to have something up next week, but I promise nothing. <laughs>